The German American Experience. Daniel Tolzman. Page 128. Page 129. Many tales are told of Wetzel's prowess. On one occasion, he is said to have killed 27 Indians. On another, this is bad. Uh, 50, he was an excellent shot and was fearless. His ferocity, uh, ferocity towards the Indians, however, knew no bounds. He once killed an Indian who had been granted safe conduct by General Harmar. Okay, I don't, I don't want to remember that. He's an asshole. Wetzel's an asshole. So they're not not all uh, great German histories. Uh, great history. The Indians continued their raids until they were subdued in 1794 by General Mad Anthony Wayne. Of uh, Revolutionary War fame, they signed the treaty and new settlements sprang up on the Ohio, the Musking, the Muskingum, the Scioto, and the Great Miami Rivers on the upper Muskingum, Muskingum, Muskingum. <laughs> The Muskegum, Muskingum, uh, Ebenezer Zane, Zahn was from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, founded Zanesville. Descended was of Zane Gray in payment for the land. He contracted to establish a pack horse trail from Wheeling to Maysville, Kentucky. Uh, U.S. mail was carried over this path for the first time in 1797. So from Wheeling, I don't know what state, to Maysville, there is a mail path. So sort of like that Pony Express, right, a mail path. Uh, they made their, made their way westward. In the same year, Zane laid out New Lancaster in this town. The first German newspaper west of the Alleghenies appeared in 1807. Der Lancaster Adler, printed in the Pennsylvania German dialect. On the present site of Wheeling, Zane built a block house that was attacked uh, during the American Revolution by a company of British soldiers and Indians. The fort was late, large, saved largely due to the heroism of Elizabeth Zane, Ebenezer's sister, who at the risk of her life rushed out to get a fresh supply of ammunition. German settlers gradually spread all over Ohio. Nearly every county contained a German township and citizens which such names as Berlin, Weinsburg, Saxon, and Hanover. Scriptural names such as Bethlehem, Salem, Nazareth, Ga Goshen, and Cannon were given to settlements of German Moravians, Dunkers, or Mennonites. Although Cincinnati did not contain a large number of Germans at first, it would become in early 19th century the major destination point of German immigration in the West, and a major distribution center for German immigrants in the Midwest, especially in the Ohio Valley. Um, in 1855, this is how German-American settlements of Missouri were described. The German settlements in the West are remarkable for their completely German appearance and their pure, purely German atmosphere, while the German farmer in Pennsylvania is more accustomed to Anglo-American ways and has even sacrificed his native tongue, or half of it at least. The German settlements in the West have preserved their native coloring unmixed. You think you are in a village in Germany when you have set foot in one of those settlements. The architecture of these houses Owing, of course, to differences in climate is a little different, but the household furnishings, the family customs, the style and method of plowing, sowing, and harvesting all remind one of Germany. A new Germany in America. The idea of founding a German-American state or a new Germany in America was a concept of some ardent young Germans in the old country who felt deeply frustrated by the state of affairs in place after the Neopol ne Napoleonic Wars. Uh, when there are many attempts to realize their political ideals and the old world failed, they turned their eyes to the new world. At the beginning of the 19th century, immigration was uncontrolled and unguided, and because of this, there was much suffering among the immigrants. However, there were idealists who thought that by concentrating the flow of immigration to a given territory, which had not yet been admitted to the Union, a German-American state might be established such as, just as the English had established New England. So since New England was established, why not a New Germany or a Little Germany or like a Little Mexico or a Little uh, uh, China or Chinatown or uh, Germantown or uh, Butchertown right? um, and other nationalities, uh, Koreatown maybe. To Irish town. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure there's other 
a little anything, right? Little any country, little Canada, little Missouri, little Kentucky. So at the beginning of the 19th century, yeah, immigration was uncontrolled and unguided. So it was uncontrolled at the beginning of the 19th century, so in the 1800s. Um, yeah, so they tried to, they regulated it. I don't know if they stopped the flow. I don't know if they sent anybody back. No, you sail across the Atlantic? No, go back. Nope, you're an illegal, go back. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I have a hard time believing it, even though it could be true. They did send Rosenberg back to Russia, but, uh, or no, they killed the Rosenbergs, but they sent Emma, Emma somebody. Dang it. Goldstein? Maybe. Uh, they sent some Russian back, so uh, uh, it did happen. But I just feel like it, that made news, that made headlines, because it wasn't a typical thing that usually happens. So, there are keen-witted theorists who saw the possibility of economic development and the advantage of future markets in overseas German colonies. However, their endeavors were hampered by the absence of a united Germany, which could have provided moral and economic support to such projects. Special efforts were made to establish a new Germany in Missouri, Texas, and Wisconsin. So little Germanys were uh, tried in Missouri, Texas, and Wisconsin. Texas is interesting because it's more south, but there were a significant number of Germans who went to Texas, uh, mostly for its independence because they were in between America and Mexico fighting their own independent, uh, fighting for their own independence. Some felt that the best chances for success uh, were Texas, since for a short period at least had been an independent, sovereign state. Moreover, there was an abundance of relatively inexpensive or even free land available in Texas. Du Duden had drawn the attention of prospect immigrants to Missouri. So that's a city, Duden. There was free land in Texas. That's why they went there. So, um, immigrants to Missouri. A number of guidebooks, and particularly the fictional accounts by Charles Sealsfield, aroused interest in Texas. During the first years of the 19th century, when Texas was under the control of Spain, there were numerous plans to settle Germans in the region, but none of them were successful. Beginning with the founding of an industrial settlement on land in Alston's colony in 1831 by Frederick Erst, Ernst from Oldenburg, several dozen German farm communities were established in the rich bottom land between the Brazos and the Colorado Rivers. All they were gener generally far removed from other settlers, they shared their fate and fortune. When the Texans rebelled against Mexico in 1836, most German men volunteered their services and helped defeat the Mexican army and General Santa Ana in the famous Battle of San Juancito. To the present day, this agricultural region, a scant 100 miles from Houston, remains many of its German ways, and many can still carry on a conversation in Texas German. Um, Yeah, so again, again, ambitious, ambitious plans were made for promoting settlements in Texas in the 40s. A Frenchman, Henry Castro, founded Castroville in Medina County. Among the settlers he induced to come were German, Swiss, and Alsatians. Alsatians. More and more Germans began to arrive in the Republic, motivated by the success of the existing colonies. An extremely positive immigrant letter sent home by Frederick Ernst and published in the Oldenburg newspaper and in the popular guidebook contributed to this German immigration to Texas. By 1841, under the leadership of Ernst, the Germans in Austin County had organized a Teutonia Ordine, which was to preserve German culture, encourage immigration, and carry on correspondence with interested parties in Germany. Through such letters and through printed reports, interest in Texas was aroused in many parts of Germany. During the important formative period of 1815 to 1850, more guidebooks were written about Texas than in any other region in America. In the 1840s, five sovereign princes and 16 noblemen formed an organization with a very ambitious plan to establish German settlements in Texas. Uh, for this purpose, these minor members of aristocracy formed the Verin Zun Schultz Deutscher Einwanderer in Texas, which is the German for Society for the Protection of German Immigrants in Texas. Each member contributed a sum of money to promote the aims of the uh, Adelsverein, which is a, the Society of Nobles, as it was popularly known, the Society of Nobles. So they were going to form their own, uh, 
uh, their own little Germany. Their little Germany, uh, they had their own society to protect their own immigrant culture. The German immigrants were organizing. Uh, they were organizing together under uh, one common nationality, which was easy since they spoke the, all the same language and they were uh, substantially different from the native uh, uh, white Americans, the white American uh, Protestants who were actually born here. I guess earlier than the German immigrants, the English could claim to be in Germany longer since the largest influx of German migration was during the 1800s. There are some Germans in Jamestown, there are some Germans in Harrodsburg and Lexington when they first were established, uh, uh, but they were not as plentiful as the English Protestants, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. I guess. I'm not sure about that, actually, because I guess there are Spanish and French who were probably here, too. Mostly English, right? Mostly English people. So, uh, John Jacob Astor was the first legendary self-made man in history, American history. Astor was born in Waldorf, near Heidelberg in 1763, migrated to England and then to America. So he's a, a German-American. Um, let's see, nativism. In the beginning, this is page 199, in the beginning the U.S. population was two-thirds Anglo-American, but the other third consisted of various ethnic groups, so at its inception the United States was a multicultural nation. However, the majority was Anglo, who by and large viewed Anglo-ethnicity as equitable with being American. So the Anglos did not look at the Germans as being the same. So the Anglos. Uh, the Anglo's, I guess, were glowing with their whiteness, and their uh, they were like, "Where, where are the original whites?" <laughs> and it also shows how the definition of white changes over the years. The view was that becoming an American meant not only the adoption of U.S. citizenship, but also Anglicization, 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 <laughs> becoming Anglicized, right? Uh, as the nature of the population come to change due to immigration in the 19th century, so too would the definition of American begin to come in question. With the arrival of large numbers of immigrants in America, strong anti-immigrant prejudice seized certain Anglo-American circles between 1852 and 1860. Those who supported the xenophobic trend soon were referred to as know-nothings, meaning the member of this movement usually pretended ignorance when asked questions about policies and goals of the organization. The Know Nothing movement stressed that native-born Americans were legitimate and authentic Americans as opposed to the recently arrived immigrants. The major strands of nativism were anti-Catholicism, fear of foreign-born radicalism, the belief in Anglo-American supremacy in relation to other groups, and the notion that others should conform to Anglicization. In the 1850s, the main charges against the Germans were that there were so many free thinkers, rationalists, atheists, and desecrators of the Puritan Sabbath in the German-American community. Indeed, it was before the Civil War that proponents of the Anglo-American Puritan Sabbath fought a losing battle, uh, those who advocated the Continental Sunday. The latter held that Sunday was a day of enjoyment for the whole family and a time to celebrate with picnics and festivities. This was, uh, this was contrasted sharply with what German Americans called the Puritan Sabbath, which frowned on all such festive frolic. So the Continental Sunday was a day of enjoyment for the whole family and a time to celebrate with picnics and festivities. The Germans brought the celebration on Sunday with picnics and festivities to America uh, and uh, uh, curtailed the Puritan Sabbath and the Anglo-Puritan uh, prudish, boring, anti-Christmas, xenophobic, racist, nativist ways. Anglo-American evangel evangelicals spoke out, publishing literature against those who advocated infidelity, socialism, and other soul-destroying errors. Some attacked the new Christian customs as foreign, others called them popish idolatries. German Americans, for their part, openly, openly defied and oppose all attempts to legislate their lifestyle, customs, and morality. In Newark, New Jersey, they petitioned the city council to repeal the Sunday Blue Laws, which caused the New York Times to publish an ed editorial on the topic of Sunday keeping. They criticized the German-Americans for turning Sunday into a pleasure-seeking Saturnalia, 
or Sat Saturna, Saturnia. Other newspapers complained about lager beer loafers who were transforming Sunday into something that it had never been before. So, the Germans brought back the Continental Sunday. On Sundays, have a picnic and have a party, some festivities, uh, get along with a, a bunch of other people. That's a ger very German-American thing to do if you do that on Sundays. Picnics and parties on Sundays. German-Americans.